Welcome to Train Spotting, and on this program, we'll be blowing the dust off those history books and going back in time at the Kreitch Tramway Village. Not content with that, I travel even further back to retrace the route of the world's first public railway. Found takes a look behind the scenes of the DLR, and I gain access to a railway classic, Toten Yard. It didn't get the best of starts in life. Its services finished at 9.30 in the evening and the stations and the trains were too small for the capacity. But it's a big boy now. Well, the original brief for the railway was actually to support the regeneration of what was then a very, very derelict area. Um, to provide transport was part of the brief. Uh, but also the reason that we actually got an automatic railway was because uh, they wanted to see something high-tech and visionary rather than perhaps some more conventional form of transport. And just to give you an idea of what's gone into it since, it's now had £940 million spent on it. So it's been upgraded 13 or 14 fold, if you like, since we actually opened it. And we've gone from moving originally about 8 million passengers per annum, today we move 43 million. Uh, in the next four years or so, we expect to go up to about 60 million passengers per annum. Uh, and the train fleet itself has expanded. We started off with 11 single car trains. Uh, we've doubled the length of the trains. We've now got 94. Uh, and the next project for the railway, one of the next projects for the railway, is in fact to increase the length of the trains again. So we'll have trains three times as long as originally envisaged. It's, it's been through major expansions, most successful of course being the, the Lewisham yes. uh, route. What about future plans? The first is to actually extend the railway to London's own, or East London's own airport, London City Airport, just down the docks. That'll be about a four and a half kilometre extension, which we will open in 2005. We're just about to start building that at the end of this year. Then beyond that, we'll be extending the railway beyond London City Airport and under the river again to Woolwich. An apparent lack of personnel at the station certainly doesn't mean there's any lack in security. Each station is closely monitored by these CCTV cameras, which are linked to a control room back in Poplar. This is an announcement to customers at Town Gateway Station. Customers requiring Canary Wharf and all stations towards Lewisham, please board the first Beckton service and change at West Ferry. The DLR was built to operate with as few personnel as possible and most of the action is controlled from here. Um, that was Steve by the way, he's got a complete uh, view of the line via the CCTV cameras that you can see over my shoulder. He can communicate with all the stations. Young Fred here is in charge of the depots, he's got Poplar Depot there and Beckton Depot there and he can send the trains in and out uh, at will. It's quite an interesting screen over here, this gives a complete overview of the railway, Tony's in charge of this particular section and he's able to communicate with the train captains, uh, British Transport Police, anyone actually operating on the railway. Finally, there's Robin over in this corner here, and he's in charge of power, and he sits in front of this very impressive mimic, as it's called. Well, it was all very interesting, wasn't it? And would have been nice to chat to one of those controllers, but unfortunately they're all busy, well, you know, controlling. It's how it should be, really. And also impossible for us to get into either of the depots here on the DLR due to the high voltages around, but uh, we have managed to secure this view of the one here at Poplar. Forget about the regeneration that the railway brings to areas, or indeed the marvel of technology that is the signalling system. What makes this railway stand out from all the rest is, you can see the front seat, look out the window, brilliant.
So when the producer said to me something about organising brewery and another word which I can't remember, I set out to prove him wrong. Here I am in the boardroom of Young's Brewery in Wandsworth in South West London, Britain's oldest brewery. And why? To show you this. This is a picture of Britain's first ever public railway. In 1801, Parliament granted permission to build a railway between Wandsworth on the banks of the Thames here in London and Croydon. And just two years later, the Surrey Iron Railway was opened. Naturally, these were in the days before Richard Trevethick and George Stevenson, so the steam locomotive hadn't yet been invented. Horses were used to drag the trucks between Croydon and Wandsworth, a distance of about eight and a half miles. And here at the brewery, horses are still used today. Now these two magnificent beasts are Wandle Mascot and Wandle General. And Kevin Flynn is the head horse keeper here at the brewery. Permission to come aboard, Kevin? Permission granted. Thank you very much. Let's just climb up these. Come on, here you go. Yeah, thank you very much. Wow. Ooh. How many horses have you got here at the brewery then, Kevin? Uh, we've got 10 shires. And uh, how many years active service do they have? Uh, generally up to about 15, 16, and then we tend to retire them off. Do you still deliver with them? Yes, yeah, very much so. We, we deliver to about 10 to 12 pubs sort of during the week. Mm -hmm. um, and is it mainly uh, for PR, or is it, uh, is it actually easier to deliver with the horses than perhaps some of the vans sometimes? Yes, I mean, I suppose quite unusual. We've got so many pubs around the brewery that it's just as quick for us to do it with the horses as it, as it would be for the lorries. It's just that initial pull and when they first get it going, and once they get it going, it should roll on nicely. And how, and how much tonnage can these guys pull? Well, when we're delivering the beer, we tend to run with a three tonne load, but that's because of the hills and that that we, we uh, have to go up and also down. But they, I mean, they can, in pulling competitions, they do go up to 40 tonnes. So in actual fact, I mean, a three tonne load really, uh, for these chaps, is not a lot. So here I am at the starting point of the Surrey Iron Railway. It's where the River Wandle, just to my left here, meets the River Thames behind. And in fact, the railway itself would have started just on the banks over there. Now, Eric Shaw's with me. Eric's from the Wandle Industrial Museum. Thanks very much for coming along this right, afternoon, Eric. Um, now, I've been referring to it as Britain's first public railway. What do you mean by public? Well, it meant that if you owned your own wagon and your own horses, on payment of a fee, you could use the railway track that you had to provide your own wagon and horses because the track belonged to a private company. So who actually owned the railway then? Well, it was the Surrey Iron Railway Company. And this was what, a conglomerate of mill owners and factory owners? That's right, yes, oh yeah. yeah. Now you've got the River Wandle here, why not build a canal with all this water? Well, funny enough, that was the original intention. But one of the problems was that a lot of the promoters were also mill owners. And there was gonna be problems if they took the water from the Wandle to feed the canal so they decided to build a railway instead. Oh, look at that. A class 66. So Eric, here at the Wandle Industrial Museum, you've got uh, more detailed history of the Surrey Iron Railway. So this is one of the original wheels then? Yes, so as far as we know. Yeah. And where did you find it? It was found in the Wandle River, supporting one of the banks of the river itself with another one. Now, earlier on at the brewery, we saw uh, examples of these sleepers. In fact, they had been turned on their side around the horse's exercise paddock. But here they are now as they would have looked, uh, what, 200 years ago. So the holes in the rails, can you explain how it all fitted together? Yes, the holes in the rails were plugged with an oak plug. And then the rails were laid, as you see, like that. And another one, of course, obvious next to it. Then the whole lot was held in place by an iron nail, which went through the grooves in the ends of the rail. And what gauge was it? Four feet, two inches. If I can just lift this up as well and show you, there we are. Yeah. Utrum was what? Is that the, uh, the company who made them? Or yes, they, yeah. they, had, they had the foundry. But some say that uh, tramways came from Utrum. Really? Hmm. So Eric, we know that the Surrey Iron Railway ran from Wandsworth down to Croydon, but you've brought me to Rotary Field here in Purley, which is south of Croydon. So why is that? Well, the reason is, Mark, but the this is the only piece of track that exists on the actual terrace that the railway ran on. But this isn't the Surrey Iron no, Railway, is it? No, this is the Croydon, Merstham and Godston, which was a continuation of the Surrey Iron Railway. So Eric, what eventually happened to the Surrey Iron Railway? Well, that folded up in 1846, and the Croydon, Merstham and Godston folded up in 1838. 
So why didn't they run steam engines on this part of the track? Because you already had the embankments and everything built. Well, funny enough, um, in 1804, they ran a steam locomotive, Trevithick, in Penny Darren in Wales, on a similar track, and the train, the locomotive, which weighed five tonnes, broke all the rails. So the track would have run along this terrace then, Eric? That's right, yeah. How far to? Well, it went to Merson, about 10 miles. 10 miles? Yeah, about 10 miles. We're not walking that now. If you want to. Well, I suppose I could do with losing a bit of weight. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> OK, today we're in the Amber Valley and we've come to have a look at some of these. Trams. Brilliant. This is the Kreitz Tramway Village, a truly wonderful museum nestling in the hills of Derbyshire. And, believe it or not, all of this was created on the site of an old quarry. It's impossible, of course, for the museum to run all of the trams all of the time, but the ones that aren't running are on display here in the depot. They're all beautifully restored and in full working order. Perhaps the most interesting one is this one, Southampton car number 45, purchased for 10 quid in 1948. It was the society's very first purchase and it's the one that started the whole collection off. You've got 70 trams here, something like that in the collection, and they're almost all completely different to each other, aren't they? they are Why, well, how did that happen? Why isn't there a standard tram that just was built for everyone? Each company, each uh, council was very proud of their own system. They built the tram to their own liking, to their, their own size, their own gauge, um, even had their own coat of arms on the trams just so that they could be proud enough to say this new tramway is ours. Trams play a very important part in our social history. The very first mechanised vehicle of any sort on any road in all of the world was a steam powered tram and at that time very inventive minds were coming up with very ingenious solutions in which to power the trams along and amongst the methods used were gas, battery, clockwork and caustic soda. Electricity, of course, was the ideal solution, but even then there were various methods of getting it from the source to the tram. The least successful of which were these. Contacts laid in the road, as a tram passed over, a skate on the tram would make contact and the power would be transferred. A very effective means of getting the electricity into the tram. Also a very effective means of getting the electricity into horses, dogs, adults, children, cats, mice. Uh, Alan, when, when was this museum founded and why? Uh, we moved here in 1959 and have been building since then. Why here? Uh, the reason behind that is, well, it's in the centre of the country. Yeah. We've got the big, uh, big towns and cities around. And, of course, we've got the historic site. The original railway was yeah. placed down by George Stevenson himself. This tram that we're travelling on at the moment um, is it's absolutely gorgeous. It's not a British tram, is it? No, it's from a Porto in Portugal. And it's, it's been restored magnificently, I have to say. Absolutely beautiful. Just talk us through this a bit. Well, this car was actually running in a Porto until just a few years ago. Uh, the Porto system was being run down. Uh, they wanted to close it, but in actual fact, we decided that it was a gap in our uh, collection. It was a typical early American style car that could be convertible. Convertible in that these windows actually open. As we've got it at the moment, in it's winter guys with the windows too. Yeah. But the windows can go into the roof right. and we can have a fully open air tram. You must be thought of here at the museum as, as somewhat leaders in restoration, are you? We like to feel that we are. Uh, the tram that we've got here, Exa Porto 273, we received it like a lot of other trams we received, in a dilapidated state. With a grant, we've recreated it to this, its original condition. Well, I remember doing this as a little kid on the old Blackpool trams. And I liked doing it then, and I like doing it now. Oh. 
This is a lovely old tram. It's ex-Leicester car number 76, and there's a nice little detail on it. The stairs from the top deck to the low deck are provided thus to aid passenger flow on and off the tram behind the driver. However, this does create a problem for the driver like this if he wants to look at anything that's happening on his near side. Well, those cunning minds in the olden days provided this in the stairs, a hole for him to look through. However, when the tram reached its terminus and the driver and the conductor changed ends, you can see quite clearly that the conductor is left in this position and he can quite clearly see ladies' ankles as they go up and down the stairs. And so a decency flap was provided. Now any rail enthusiast worth his salt will know why I'm here near the village of Long Eaton in Nottinghamshire. Forget Crewe, forget Stratford in East London and forget York. This is the mecca for diesel locomotives. This is the mother of all yards. This is the mighty Toten. Well, I think it's exciting anyway. The yard was formed in 1856, mainly because of the huge coal mining industry in this area. And they needed a yard this big, not only to hold the coal, but to be able to transport it to the major cities throughout the UK. When the engine depot was built, it was the biggest in Western Europe, and it's now owned by EWS. Since their formation in 1996, they've spent three quarters of a billion pounds on 2,500 brand new wagons and 280 new locomotives, mostly classes 66 and 67, and they cost a million and a quarter pounds each. Now, an integral part of the yard is the maintenance depot. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. David Riley is one of the chief engineers for EWS, and he's going to show us round. So, Dave, over the years, you've had virtually every single class of uh, locomotive through here at Toten. I suppose you must have the best maintenance crews in the UK. We've got, I would say, at least two to 3,000 years' experience really? currently on the depot, yes. So that, that, that gives you an idea into the, the current knowledge of the workforce that we've got. So how many locos have you got based here at Toten then, Dave? Currently at Toten, we've got only 75 locomotives, which, is, which isn't a great deal for the size of the location. However, we do an awful lot of work for, the, for other train operating companies. So what's happening with this Class 58 here then, Dave? It's in for an overhaul for a possible contract for Dutch Railways. What we'll do, we'll put a new power unit in it, we'll put new bogies on it, and we'll give it a jolly good paint. Now, some engines must be easier to work on than others. Absolutely, absolutely. You take this 58, for instance, you can, you can actually get to the bits you're working on. This was actually built with maintenance in mind. Tell me about your nuts, because on a car, uh, compared to this and compared to a, a Class 60 over there, uh, what's the, the torque on the nuts we've got here? Well, for a car, your, your basic old-fashioned car, you'd be looking at 35 to 40 feet pound to, to tighten the head down. On these, on a 58, if memory serves me right, it's about 1,600 feet pound. Wow. And for our Class 60 over there with the Murdy's engine, it's about 22,000 feet pound. Excuse my question, how do you get your nuts off? Hydraulics. Ah. <laughs> okay, so that's what's happening with this Class 58. Now here you've got a Class 60, uh, number 6100, the Boar of Badenoch one of the last British-built freight locomotives, and as there were just 100 built, I presume it was the very last one built. Now, it's a huge engine, and here we have a massive power unit to go with a Class 60. Has this actual power unit come from this locomotive then, Dave? In a word, no. This power unit's from a previous Class 60. It came as a, in as a tired old engine with 15,000 tops hours, which meant it wanted an overhaul. So do you always have one Class 60 engine overhauled and ready to go to put into another loco when it comes in? Absolutely. It, keep, it keeps them out in traffic. Now this set of refurbished bogies here belongs to a Class 47 from South Wales. And soon it will be making its way down to the Principality uh, to be reunited with its engine. Now after about 50,000 to 100,000 miles, the wheels will need to be reprofiled. And that happens just over here. So this is the wheel profiling pit that I'm in here at the moment at Toten Depot. Now what happens is, is a locomotive will come over this pit and the wheels will be aligned to this roller here. The roller fits into the wheel and then lifts the wheel off the rails, spins it round and then this cutter here 
cuts into the wheel as it's spinning and then reprofiles the wheel. Ingenious, eh? Now this is the paint shop here at Toten Yard and this is a class 142 two car first northwestern unit number 004 which as you can see has been beautifully painted in its uh, corporate colours. Now before it does get painted it has to be rubbed down by hand and then filled in before it gets resprayed. This colour yellow has to be the right pigment by railway legislation. Every single locomotive and train in the UK is this particular yellow pigment. Now once it has been resprayed in this part of the, uh, the shed, then it's taken down to that part where there are heaters blown on it and it gets baked for about an hour at gas mark one, which to you and me is about 75 to 80 degrees. Now this is something you're not going to be seeing much more of in the future. With the introduction of new locos to EWS, locos like this one, 37057 Viking and Old English Electric, are being gradually phased out. And it's a real shame because they've got so much more character than these newer ones. Is Toten? Don't you know? Yeah, of course I do. It's, um, it's between Long Eaton and Sandy Acre. Acre. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, did you see my piece about the tramway museum? Yeah, near isn't Crich. that? Actually, what I was going to say was, isn't it off the A6? Yeah. Between Belper and Matlock. Yeah. Just off the B5035. Yeah. That is where it is. <laughs> 